Oklahoma is the land of second, third, and last chances. Who were the people that made it so? The Red River Institute, johnjdwyer.com, me, Gwen Falconer Lippert, and our signature sponsor, Atwoods, present Oklahoma Gold. Together with award-winning author and historian, John J. Dwyer, we'll stitch the golden threads of Oklahoma history. Here now on Oklahoma Gold. Dignifying our history by the stories we marvel at. John J. Dwyer, America's youngest aviator in Oklahoma. What's this story? Well, Glenn, it's one we all should know, and it'll be exciting to know it. It's one of the glittering golden nuggets, really, a whole field of them, that grow visible as you read our richly illustrated Oklahomans II Oklahoma history book. That's about our state's modern history. And that is the theme of the state's breathtaking history in aviation and its leading role in forging America as the unchallenged perennial world leader in this important field. The pilots, the inventors, the airlines, the war heroes, the military bases, the political visionaries, Oklahoma has led the way in all of them, as our book reveals. But none remain more remarkable and, sadly, more overlooked than the dauntless hero whose story we're honored to share with you today. And even if you're among the tiny percentage of Oklahomans who even know her name, I'm confident this will prove an amazing and, I trust, inspiring tale of Oklahoma grit and glory. So let's go back nearly a century now to rural 1927 Stevens County in southwest Oklahoma, where folks along the old Chisholm Trail rarely saw an airplane in flight. Thus, when a monoplane circled Marlow, 10 miles north of Duncan, one morning and landed on blind entrepreneur George Carter's spread just east of town, a crowd gathered to investigate. The pilot who stepped out of the aircraft was himself blind in one eye, as evidenced by the black eye patch he wore. And if you guessed Wiley Post was that man, you'd be right. But at that point, Gwen, he was an unknown ex-convict who had just completed his own first solo flight, and who also had a brother named Joe, who just happened to live across the road from Carter's pasture. Living with George Carter was his 11-year-old daughter, Pearl, whose thirst for learning and adventure seemed inexhaustible. And if you wonder what I mean by that, consider this. At age 11, she not only already drove automobiles, real ones on real bumpy, dirty, ugly roads back in the 1920s, but she served her father as his business chauffeur. Well, after lunch, Wiley Post asked Carter, would he enjoy a ride aloft in Post's plane? Carter, despite his blindness, accepted. When they returned, Pearl peppered them both with questions, then announced that she would like to go up next. Her biographer, Paul F. Lambert, described what followed. With George's permission... Pearl became Wiley's next passenger that day, wrote Lambert. Wiley could see that Pearl was fearless and eager to learn. The plane had dual controls, so Wiley decided to give her a basic flying lesson. First, he had her put her feet on the pedals that controlled the ailerons so she could feel how they moved and how the plane responded when Wiley manipulated them. He also told her to hold her stick real light. Pearl was enthralled. She knew immediately that she wanted to learn all about flying. And that's the end of Lambert's quote. Well, over the next months, Wiley Post returned to Marlowe to see his brother, visit with George. Their eye problems actually strengthened the two's bond, and to coach Pearl as an aviator. The next year, when she was 12 and still under 5 feet tall, George spent nearly $5,000, a hefty amount back then, to build her a state-of-the-art Curtis Robin airplane. He spent additional money to clear a small airfield and construct a hangar. Nearly 26 feet long and 41 feet in wingspan, the Curtis Robin weighed close to three-quarters of a ton and featured a powerful OX-5 engine. The model gained fame as the aircraft of choice for the era's daredevil barnstorming pilots, 
who traveled through the American heartland staging flying shows. The following year, at age 13, after continued coaching from post, Pearl Carter flew solo, thus becoming the youngest aviator in American history. For the next five years, the Oklahoman gained fame, first for that, then as a daredevil stunt flyer at popular southern and western Oklahoma air shows. Still a teenager, she excelled in barrel rolls, spins, dives, and other airborne feats. She even attempted to parachute out of a plane, though her parents vetoed that effort. (laughs) During that time, though, Pearl's exceptional relationship with her father ruptured when she defied his wishes and married Marlowe farmer Lewis Scotty Scott and bore him daughter George and son Billy. Another son, Carter, arrived in 1936. Pearl thus had three children by the time she was 20. These developments led to one of the most difficult decisions of her life. She gave up flying at the peak of her success and popularity and still only 18 years of age. She explained the momentous decision by calling herself just too much of a daredevil to be a young wife and the mother of little children. The Great Depression, meanwhile, ruined her father's financial fortunes, as it did multitudes of other Americans, including many wealthy ones. He died in 1935, before his economic malaise lifted. Fortunately, though, he and Pearl had reconciled. George Carter had imbued in his daughter a fearlessness and sense of the possible that, coupled with her own audacious spirit, helped propel her to feats early as well as late in life, that few people could have accomplished. Meanwhile, Scotty's limitations as a provider, his and Pearl's long separations due to his itinerant jobs, and his struggles with alcohol compounded her economic challenges. For decades, she experienced the riches to rags part of what she would later call her riches to rags to riches life story. She sadly blamed Scotty and the alcoholism that has ruined so very many of Oklahomans' earthly hopes and dreams for losing, and I'm quoting her now, my farms, my home, my everything. Even the pickup was wrecked on a drunken spree. That's the end of the quote. She divorced him in 1961, despite his urging her not to end their 30 years of marriage. In later years, she realized that she still loved him, how much he had loved her and the children and that he would remain forever the love of her life. She wept deeply upon his 1975 death. But Gwen, as we'll discover following the break, Pearl Carter Scott's greatest glory would unfold long after she exchanged aviation fame for diapers and pacifiers. She had such a rich life before the age of 20. I can't imagine what you're going to tell me next. Well, it's amazing, and I'd encourage people who haven't seen it. There's a great uh, film that came out some years ago. The Chickasaws produced a a major motion picture called Pearl. I think uh, it's a great movie. Hardly recommend. You should be able to watch it on Amazon. This is Oklahoma Gold. Dignifying our history by this remarkable story, America's youngest aviator, and she did all these things before the age of 20? John J. Dwyer, tell me about Pearl Carter Scott. Well, and Gwen, we haven't even mentioned, I kind of forgot to mention, uh, when she was in high school, she'd fly that Curtis Robin. She was a Marlowe High outlaw cheerleader, and she'd fly that plane around the field and land it in the, in the pasture right next to the Marlowe football field, get out of it, and go over there on the sidelines and cheerlead for the Marlowe High football team. So Now, that's very local. That's amazing. Uh, right by Wild Horse Creek. Uh, I think we could probably have a series on, on Pearl, but as we uncover the remarkable life of Marlowe native Pearl Carter Scott. As we talked about before the break, America's youngest female aviator and one of the most talented and daring barnstorming stunt flyers, male or female, ever to soar over the vast reaches and through the endless skies of the Southern Plains. In this case, the Golden Nugget shined and expanded 
for years, indeed for decades. For in 1972, at the age of 65, when most folks are settling their affairs and winding down for the final chapters of their life, Pearl embarked on a new adventure. It proved one of the great accomplishments of her long and storied journey. She hired on as a community health representative, or CHR, for the Chickasaw Nation. Her devout Methodist mother, Lucy, possessed half Choctaw and half Chickasaw blood. And you see Lucy, along with Pearl in that film we were talking about, named Pearl. And Pearl grew increasingly devoted to the latter tribe, the Chickasaws, in her later years. Of her native heritage, she declared, it has meant everything. Well, her ostensible job aimed to help connect needy tribal members with health, diet, sanitation, and other services. According to Pearl, however, we vaccinated dogs. We vaccinated cats. We gave people shots. We'd take their temperatures. We'd go with them and help them get anything they needed. We were even taught how to deliver babies. She drove up and down remote hills and explored dirt and mud roads in order to find the suffering folks across the Chickasaw Nation of southern and southwest Oklahoma. They included the clinically depressed, the alcohol enslaved, and the hopeless. She paid for extra gas and expenses for her car out of her own pocket. She impoverished herself to buy hungry children groceries. Many was the Chickasaw father who put his arms around her neck to, quote, just cry because I got their kids something to eat. It was just pitiful. When you see kids hungry, you're going to feed them. That's the end of the quote. And again, you can read much more about this in Paul F. Lambert's great book, uh, Never Give Up, about Pearl Carter Scott. Well, her granddaughter, Beverly Louise Parker, lived with Pearl during much of this time that we're discussing, the 1970s and 80s and 90s. She recalled the telephone often ringing in the middle of the night, and Parker said, it would be somebody needing help. She'd jump up, get dressed, get in the car, and go break up a family fight or respond to someone being drunk or in jail. She just worked all the time. That phone never stopped ringing, end quote. And that was Beverly Parker, Pearl's granddaughter, remembering that as Pearl worked for the Chickasaws, serving the people across southern Oklahoma. Pearl's grandson, Craig, delivered her one of the great gifts of her later life when, in 1970, he took her flying. When he turned the controls over to her and she piloted the aircraft, she did so for the first time in 37 years. Then, believe it or not, in 1996, at 80 years of age, she flew a King airplane. Pearl Carter Scott weathered much grief in her long life. Both her parents, her still-beloved former husband, all her siblings, close friends like Wally Post, and even her son Carter, all died before her own passing in 2005 at the age of 89. But she died as she lived, rich in friends, honors, and accomplishments. Wiley Post had kindled her confidence and willingness to take on unprecedented challenges, and he considered her a born flyer. He once admonished her not to let, quoting Wiley now, anything deter you from what you want to do. You may fall down once in a while, but don't give up. Get mad and get up and show them that you can do what you can. And that's the end of Wiley's quote. And did she ever take that advice, Gwen, overcoming so much and helping so many? Her life embodied the epitaph she left for herself, never give up. So that was her mantra? That was it. Never give up. Now that's Oklahoma Gold.